There are numerous points in the timeline where you can point to the beginning of the end. One of the major pieces occurred last year during Patriots training camp. New England didn't want to give Brady more years. They wanted him to be a year-to-year -year player. He was going to be a 43-year-old quarterback and it's obvious Belichick was scared of a cliff. We know Brady has been able to delay that major drop-off in play more than any quarterback in history. But this is Bill Belichick. It doesn't matter who the player is. He wants them gone before the drop-off, not during the drop-off. That's why no matter how much he loves a player, or no matter how much a player has done for him and the franchise, he always wants to be ahead of the curve. That's how he operates. We've seen it with Randy Moss. We've seen it with Richard Seymour, Wes Welker, Adam Vinatieri. The list goes on and on. But maybe most importantly, we saw it with Drew Bledsoe. Belichick did want to keep Brady, but he didn't want to be left on the hook if something bad happened. So his goals were to keep the years at a minimum and the pay done through bonuses. Brady, on the other hand, wanted security and respect, meaning more years and more money, but I think it was mainly more years. He wanted them to believe he could play until that golden age of 45. Tom Curran, a well-connected Patriots insider, wrote, Before the 2019 season, it took Brady seriously considering walking out of training camp before the Patriots gave him a raise and agreed to remove the franchise tag for 2020. Brady didn't want the franchise tag on him because he didn't want to be stuck in a year-to-year -year situation. He wanted that security and respect. Like two sides normally must do in a deal, they met in the middle and decided to give Brady freedom for the 2020 offseason. And around came the 2020 offseason. Before legal tampering begun, Belichick had a phone call with Brady. Multiple reports came out saying it didn't go well and that Belichick had basically said their offer from the previous year stood which meant a one-year bonus-driven deal. I think this was another major turning point in the story. When you listen to Brady and Kraft after the Pat season ended, it really sounded like he was coming back. So when the reports started coming out about a phone call going poorly or Jeff Darlington saying on ESPN that he would be shocked if Brady went back to New England, from the outside, it was just hard to believe. But these reports continued one after another. Then the Monday where legal tampering officially began. Odds Shark suddenly switched the Brady free agency odds to favor the Buccaneers over the Patriots. And that's when I personally started to think that this was actually going to happen. Follow the money, they say. Maybe it was obvious all along. He did put his Boston house up for sale months ago. Even Robert Kraft has since reflected on this, telling Giardi, when you think about it, he sold his house, and enrolled his kids in school and other places, and then proceeded to say the Patriots would have made a deal. And I don't think the Patriots' first day of free agency helped at all. Brady watched as two key pieces on defense left, with Kyle Van Noy going to the Dolphins and Jamie Collins going to the Lions. And star receivers getting moved around the league like DeAndre Hopkins and Stephon Diggs, while the Patriots just sat there in cap space limbo. It was pretty much a guarantee for them to return with a worse team than the wild card round eliminated one they put out last year. That same day, Brady was out listening to offers from the Bucks and Chargers, and who knows who else. Giardi said, I'm told Tampa Bay and the LA Chargers showed Tom Brady plenty of love yesterday, both in terms of kissing the rings and making strong financial commitments. Brady is getting exactly what he wanted, and the exact thing the Patriots refused to give him. But obviously, that's not everything. There's so many other factors and reasons that led to this decision. Last year, the Patriots receivers were absolutely terrible at getting any separation, and here are the numbers to prove it. The league average for average separation at the time of the throw last year was 2.997 yards. Julian Edelman, Tom Brady's right-hand man, and the Patriots' number one receiver, was below league average. He stood at 2.82, which ranked him 106th in the entire NFL. Mohamed Sanu, who the Patriots spent a second-round pick to go and get, was at 2.77, which ranked 112th. Sanu was battling an ankle injury for most of his time with the Patriots, so he should improve, but it just adds extra salt in the wound to how bad last year was for this receiving core. Jacoby Myers, the undrafted rookie who ended up making the team and then getting good playing time after the whole Antonio Brown debacle and other injuries among the wide receivers, he ranked 120th. Philip Dorsett, the veteran player who has never found his footing in the NFL and is now a free agent himself, 121st. And finally, we have Nikhil Harry, the first round pick who battled injuries, ranked 143rd. Guess what the most shocking piece of all this is? These rankings are of the wide receivers who ran at least 100 routes, and there were only 143 of them. Every single Patriots receiver ranked outside the top 100 of a list of 143 players, and their first round pick ranked last. So yes, there are numbers to back up Brady's unprecedented frustration that we saw last year. And on top of all that, there was a Gronk-sized hole at tight end for the entire season. Remember when...